On Sunday nights, we're in a study on the gospel in the stars and how that God has written down in the stars the message of the gospel. Let's go back over to Psalms, the 19th chapter. We're using this as a key verse because this speaks of God preaching to the world by way of the stars. Now, let's begin to read here in the first verse of Psalms, the 19th chapter, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. Of course, the word declare, we've said, is C-E-P-H-A-R, Safar, or C-A-P-H-A-R. And we that means to enumerate in an exact order, it is a census term. When you take a census, you take everyone's name and a family and the number of the people in the family. And when I see name and number, I, that always reminds me of the name or the number of the beast. Of course, name is the word Shem. And if everyone's Shem is taken, that means authority. Now, if you take a census in Hendersonville and you come to 104 Irvin and you and you say, who lives there? Who's the head of the household? They'll say Jim Brown is head of the household. And you'll know who that is. That's that crazy guy on television that preaches real hard and he says things that upsets people. Well, you'll know by that authority who it is. You'll know which Brown that is. Now, if it's Sam Brown, you'll say, who's that? Well, if he owns a drugstore or if he pumps gas, that means he's the guy that goes down there and has a certain kind of personality when he pumps gas for a living. Well, you'll know that, that Jim Brown at 104 Urban, his authority or his name or who he is and how many people that he leads in that household down there on Urban. Well, that's exactly what a census is to find out the authority and an authority preaches a message. In any household, there's certain laws. You can go into one household and the family will abide by these certain rules. I was talking to uh, somebody this past week, one of the guys that comes here, and he said, in our household, it is total chaos. He said, my wife doesn't want the truth. He said, the family uh, is cussing. Uh, they'll say all kinds of things, and they'll be watching all these R-rated movies. I said, you need to get out of that house. He doesn't need to have that as his authority. Well, let's read on here. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. And that word handiwork means it's the work of God. It is a like a mosaic. And when we speak of handiwork, it reminds me, every time I read that, it reminds me of Ephesians 2 and 10, where the scripture says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, Unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And that word uh, workmanship is P O I E M A. Everything God does is a workmanship. He doesn't do anything haphazardly. And that word workmanship, poema, write that down, workmanship, that is the same thing as a, if you had a a man who painted pictures or someone who put together mosaics or a lady who would weave tapestries. That's what that means. That is a that means a tapestry of fabric. Tapestry or a fabric. When you have a fabric, that fabric is material that has a weaving to it and it has an exact orderly arrangement to that. When we speak of the word world in John three sixteen it's cosmos, and the cosmos, this word cosmos means orderly arrangement, for God so loved the orderly arrangement of mankind. And when you're saying the heavens declare the glory of God, 
You can actually include this word orderly arrangement from John 3.16 because all of the old ancient uh, Stoics, Stoic, Stoicism was probably the most popular uh, of all the philosophies and a man named Zeno begins Stoicism somewhere around 3, I believe it's 334 to 310, somewhere in that neighborhood B.C. So in, for, in the 4th century, in the 4th century uh, B.C., Zeno said there was a great orderly arrangement to all of the universe and he called that the cosmos and he said it was a living, breathing entity. He said it was alive and that fire and pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, fire and pneuma gave this cosmos life and Jesus used that very terminology meaning an orderly arrangement and he said fire and pneuma or fire and spirit reminds us of what John says and if you'll notice I can't even go over here to the to Safar without thinking about the cosmos or the orderly arrangement of all things because God has not only arranged our lives, He's written all of the history and the stars. Now, let's continue reading here. And He says, Day unto day uttereth speech. And that word uttereth is naba, N-A-B-A, N-A-B-A. And that means to gush forth. It's like a great shower of words of God. It gushes forth speech. Uh, and that word speech is O-M-E-R, O-M-E-R. That word, that is the word speech. Let's look at that. Speech, that's Omer. And that word Omer means, uh, it means a promise, a promise. The heavens utters the promise of God. In fact, everything in the heavens, when you see the woman, you see the woman or you see the virgin, every time you see the virgin, it's not talking about Mary. It's talking about Israel. We know that Jesus was born of a virgin, but Mary is a picture of Israel. Israel isn't a picture of Mary. It's talking about uh, the virgin is Israel that brings forth Christ. Now, I'm going to go into the word virgin here in a moment <coughs> because this is what it's about. And he says... Their line, and that word line is kav, line, and that is Q-A-V, and that means a bound, a bound or a boundary, their line, God has an exact boundary for the arrangement of all things, and he said their line or their cord, or their connecting cord, or their measuring rule. And it also means musical strings. The stars sing out the glory of God. He says their line is going out through all the earth, and their words, that is the word mila, M-I-L-L-A-H, their words... M-I-L-L-A-H. That word mila, it's, it is a synonym for the New Testament word lego. L-E-G-O. What is that word? That is a systematic discourse. A discourse is a, it is a report. If you give a discourse in school, you write down a speech according to some system, then you stand up and give that speech. And it has to have some order and some arrangement. If the teacher says, give us a discourse on uh, uh, what happens when you mix this acid with this base, or what happens when you do a certain kind of experiment in chemistry lab or in physics, a discourse is a rehearsed speech according to a system. It means a commandment. 
Then he says that their line is going out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And in them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit A circuit is completing a circle. Now, my grandfather was a circuit-riding Methodist preacher in the early 1900s down in Texas, and he would go to one church and then go to another church and go to another church over a weekend and go to another one. He passed like five churches, and he would go around to these churches and come back home after the fifth one. Now, that means to make a circle... And he's, that's exactly what the Maseroth is. The Maseroth, we call it zo- Zodiac, but the pagans have gotten a hold of it. What it does, it preaches about the redemption of man. And when you see the virgin, that's talking about Israel. When you see the hero, what you're looking at is Christ, not Hercules, not Orion, not Perseus, not any of these other things. The flying horse, we said, is not Pegasus, but the flying white horse of Christ when he comes back with eyes as a flame of fire. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. And then he goes to talking about the law of God. He is equating everything that's in the heaven with God's law and what God is doing uh, concerning our redemption, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. He is telling us that what's written in the stars is God's word, God's systematic discourse, His law And it's a handiwork that he's laid out with his hands. Well, that's fantastic. And the Bible says that God gave the stars their names. I said this the first week I preached on this. But let's look at that one more time over here in Psalms 147 and 4. We know that the stars had everything to do with the coming of Christ. And I'm going to try to go through that with you tonight a little bit. 147. Psalms 147 and verse 4. Well, let's read down, start in verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars... He calleth them all by their names. God is the one who named the stars. Then he brought the animals to Adam for him to name. But he said, I don't trust nobody with my message to write it down but me. He doesn't put any trust in us, in his saints. That word telleth is the word mana, M-A-N-A-H, M-A-N-A-H. And God's righteousness is just. And that word means to weigh out. That means to have a just weight before the Lord. Now we're talking about, we're going to talk about the weights tonight because we've been talking about the Maseroth and the scripture teaches us, let me erase some of this and kind of get started over again here. Because God named the stars... And he has a circuit. Now, we've already talked about the circuit. We've been talking about the centaur as Christ. The centaur was a horse man or a man who was a horse. And that's what the people thought. They thought they were one and the same when they first began to see them because back centuries ago, horses were only equated with war. And the horses, when some of the men in the world saw them for the first time, especially when Cortez... Went, took the conquistadors and went down, began to conquer Mexico. When he did that, the Aztecs thought that the horsemen 
uh, the men on the horse and the horse were one and the same, so they came up with the idea of the centaur. Well, that's merely nothing but mythology pulling out of the stars. Christ on the white horse, he'll come back with eyes as a flame of fire, and his bow will be in the centaurs had the bows in their hands, and they were said to be great giant bull slayers. Well, it sounds like Nimrod on a horse chasing down the great bull and putting the horns on his head and the hooves on his feet and tying the tail around his waist, and we get the picture of Satan from that. That's all it is. All of this is really not as mysterious as men make it sound. He said he tells us the number of the stars, he tell it there has to be an exact number. He weighs it out and allots it and enumerates. That word means to put an exact number of stars down to tell a particular story. It means to appoint or to the number or to prepare or set or tell. And when he says he calleth them all by name, the word call is the word Q-A-R-A. Kara, Q-A-R-A. And that word kara means to address by name, by proclamation, to publish, or to read. And it comes from another word that spelled the same meaning to happen or to meet. It means a, and a kore, Q-O-R-E, Q-O-R-E is a caller. And does he not call us? And he's written our redemption in the stars. It's unbelievable how God has arranged all this now. Let's go back over here one more time to Genesis. I've got to bring this out as we go. Genesis, the 15th chapter. I've got one other verse to give you on God naming the stars. Let's, uh, you don't have two Bibles like I do. I've got two Bibles here. I'm going to turn in one of them over to turning one of them over to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. 40, and then I'm going to go back to Genesis 15. Isaiah 40, in verse 26, he says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who created these things that bringeth out their host by number. And that word number is M-I-C-P-A-R, M-I-C-P-A-R. Now, that is a really, a really interesting word because it means narration. What do you do when you narrate something? You actually... If something is happening, the narrator on the old radio shows, they would be the guy that was telling what was happening on Fibber McGee and Molly, uh, our own uh, gangbusters, those of us who used to listen to the radio, and they'd tell what was happening or what was about to happen, and the narrator would slip in and say certain things. That's the guy describing what is happening and what is being said. That's the narrator. And that's what God has done. He's narrating. He says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out the host by their narration, he, or by their number, which means narration, he calleth them all by their names. The word is Shem. And so the number and the name, the number is the narration. And the name is their authority. It would be like the actors in a play acting out a play. And the words that they were speaking would be the narration. And the names would be the people or the authority saying the word. By their authority, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong and power, not one faileth. Boy, I love that, don't y'all? That's so fantastic that... God has got a narration and he's got some preachers preaching and they are the stars of heaven. Now let's go back over here one more time to one more time back over to Genesis 15 because these are the basic scriptures that we're using in this series. We really need to understand this. Now there is, there is a circuit 
of the stars. It is a, a like an oval. We would call it that. And in this, you have got 12 signs of Maseroth. And that's not something we made up. That's something God speaks to Job. And each one of these signs has what we call three decans, D-E-C-A-N, and that means three parts to it are three minor pictures in that. And we're talking about each one of them. We've been going to the first sign of Virgo. Now this is where, now we realize this is not where the, the star charts start, but this is where God starts His narration of the stars. He does not start where the world starts. He starts with Virgo. And like the, like the writers say, you're going to find the secret to all of this in the Sphinx because the Sphinx starts with the head of the woman. That's with the head of the woman. And it starts with the woman, with Virgo, and right Virgo, and right before that is Leo, the sign of Leo. That is the lion. And Virgo is the virgin. And all of, the, and all of your old ancients will tell us that that is the Sphinx. The Sphinx, that the, that the sign of this, we find it in the Sphinx. The Sphinx has the body of a lion, the head of a virgin, and we find that Christ started with a, as a started coming from the virgin, and he will end in the tenth chapter of Revelation. He will come back as a lion. That will be the finish of it all. That's when the lion and the virgin meet. Let me read something to you out of here about the Maseroths. When the Lord tells Job, "Can you bring forth Maseroth?" He says here the word. I'm reading out of God's voice in the stars by Kenneth Fleming. The word Maseroth occurs twice in Scripture. First, in Job 38, 32, and again, in a slightly different form in 2 Kings 23, 5. The English Revised Version has the 12 signs, and in the margin, the signs of the Zodiac. The word itself means, the word Maseroth means the separated, the divided, or the apportioned, and it refers to the allotted spaces given to the twelve signs in the circle of the zodiacs. These are the signs that mark the twelve divisions of the year. We have twelve months in a year. There were twelve tribes in Israel, twelve sons of Jacob. Each one of them is attributed to each one of these signs, and when I get to this, we're going to try to go through this. You had twelve apostles, twelve is the number of the church, 12 times 12, <coughs> is 144. And the 144,000 is the virgin church purified. Now, I'm going to try to get to that tonight. Now, let me read something else to you. Uh, he says here that the scriptures mention the 12 signs of the zodiac. He said, we tend to assume that the zodiac was always central to the devil-inspired teaching of astrologers. It is true that astrology uses the signs of the zodiac in a corrupted form, but it is not true that astrology invented them or originated them. What astrology has done is to corrupt them and change their use from that which God originally intended. A little reflection will underscore the truth that a large part of the evil in our world is a perversion or twisting of that which is good. Pride is the perversion of personal dignity. Tyranny is the perversion of legitimate rulership. Licentiousness is the perversion of marriage relationship. Idolatry is the perversion of worship of God. This principle is also valid in regard to astrology as we know it today, which is a perversion of of ancient star knowledge by which the glory of God is declared. Now, let's go back over here to Genesis 15. And we're going to talk about the scales. I'm going to start talking about the scales tonight. 
I'm going to finish up some things on the virgin because there's some things I want you to see that's really interesting. Remember the zodiac is the word separate. That has to do with the virgin. Now, let's look here in Genesis 15 and verse... uh, We're going to look down here at verse 5. God comes to Abraham and he said... Abraham says to God, I'm childless. All I have is Eliezer, this Syrian in my household. And he said, that will not be your heir. It'll be one that comes out of your bowels. Then he says to him... He brought him forth abroad and said, verse 5, Look now toward the heaven and tell the stars. Tell is that word sapphire. Tell the stars. Enumerate them and number them in the exact order and they will narrate the story of your children in Christ, in the Messiah. That's what he's saying. Then he said, Tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And we find that same verse over here in Genesis. It's speaking of Christ. The stars speak of Christ because Galatians, the third chapter, tell us when he says, So shall thy seed be. He's talking about Christ, not evil. And he says it here in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Galatians, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. One seed, many, many children, and it will be enumerated in the stars. When you find the evil, every bit of the things in the stars, you find that the serpents and the scorpions are the picture of Satan, of course, the word scorpion is, is S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S. And then the verb form of scorpion is S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O. And that word scorpizo means scatter abroad. And the scripture speaks of the scattering abroad as what happened at Babylon. And Jesus said that the hireling cares not for the sheep because he scatters them, scorpizo, A scorpion is a false teacher. That's talking about false teachers in the stars. Now, one of the writers here says that the scorpion is supposed to be holding the scale, one of the ends of the scales, down. It's a false balance. In fact, the first sign is Virgo. We've been talking about that. And I've got some things to say about Virgo before we quit. I'm going to try to get to read to you how they came about understanding that the wise men in the east saw the star of Christ, but the first sign of the Maseroth, as we believe it, it has to start with Virgo, and this is the first sign of the Zodiac. This, the first sign has, the main sign is the Virgin, and the, and the three decons is the Coma, or the desired one, that's the desired child in the lap of the virgin, and then the centaur, which is Christ coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. Centaurs were considered evil. That's a perversion of truth. Then you had Boots, the, the reaper. He has the scythe in one hand, and he has the shepherd's staff in the other. The shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and the reaper separates the wheat from the tares. And we saw that in the 13th chapter of Matthew about the wheat from the tares. The 25th chapter of Matthew, he separates the sheep from the goats. So the reaper is the shepherd. He is the grim reaper. That is Christ, the good shepherd. He will destroy the tares or the goats and he will harvest the wheat or the sheep. Now, the second sign, let me give you this. I'm going to go back to the virgin. The second sign of the zodiac has to do with the redeemer. One is the corona, the crown. The corona is the crown. And then the, that is one of the decans. The other, the main sign is the scales in the balance. Well, even talk about Belshazzar, the great grandson or great nephew. They're not quite sure which he was. He was the great 
grandson or nephew of, of Nebuchadnezzar, when the Lord said, Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And when the scripture says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the word short means deficient. It's the word who's to rest us. And it means to be deficient in an amount to redeem. That's what the balances are. And it's so amazing. I asked Andy if he knew something about the justice being blind and he brought something to me on the scales. I'm going to be studying this. I'm very sure that we get this out of the ancient world because Athena was the goddess of cities or the goddess of fortifications and she is the one who held the scales in the balance and she was ahead of the Babylonian democracy. That's what's so amazing. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Because Babylon was a democracy. In fact, let me read that. Oh, you have the lupus, the victim. You have the corona. That's Christ coming back to be. It's not that kind of a crown. They get the wrong crown. It's a diadem that he has. That's, that's, uh, those pointed crowns come out of the fact, when you see the, the pointed crowns, that comes out of the horns of Nimrod. Now, whoever drew that, they didn't know what a diadem was. So the writer of this book, or the illustrator, got the crown wrong. And the balance is the, is the main decan, then you have the corona, and you have the, the lupus, which is the victim. That's a picture of Christ. And then you have the southern cross in that picture. And we're going to try to hit some of those. But what I'm going to do, let me, let me show you this. The one who held the scales was Athena. She was equivalent. And we know what that is. That is not... Athena was not a virgin. She was uh, nothing but the... Uh, she was just another picture of the Ashtaroth. All the Ashtaroth... Uh, the Ashtaroth... Let me write that down. A-S-H. Oops, that won't write. Ashtaroth. All the Ashtaroth... When you put E-T-H, that's singular. And when you put O-T-H, that's plural. And that means all of the female deities. And we know A-S-T-E-R is the Greek star, the Greek word for star. And we know that uh, <coughs> the Ashtaroth were all the female deities. And they were all the picture of Semiramis, the mother of Nimrod. And what she did was pull the message out of the stars and replace herself in the place of the virgin. And when you find the virgin, wherever you find her in the stars, that is the picture of Israel. Of course, Mary is the type of that. And I'm not going to discount that. Because God, it, the whole purpose of being born of a virgin, I, wor I wondered about that for years. Why would, why would it be so important to be considered be virgin born? And when the Southern Baptists, and I'm going to give them a hard time, when they say, we believe in the virgin birth, no, you don't. It doesn't matter what you say. If you did, you would believe that the one that is born of a virgin is a living God. And if you believe that that one is virgin born, you believe he's a living God, you'd be afraid enough of him to believe his words. That's the point. And so whatever you, whatever you say, well, we believe in the virgin birth. Well, so did the mysteries of Hercules, and so did the mysteries of Perseus, and so did the mysteries of Orion, and so did the Aleutian mysteries, and so did the Dionysian mysteries. All the mysteries had a virgin-born son. To say we believe in the virgin birth is a very redundant statement unless you're going to do what that God says. When he says agonize, you'll do it over sin. When he says repent, you'll believe that rather than telling someone to accept Christ. When the Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, you can accept Christ. And I told Sidney, I'm not saying that anybody who says they accepted Christ is not saved. I'm saying some of those people, when they start walking down the aisle, they get down to the altar, they're already believers, and they get down there, and some preacher says, well, would you like to get saved? And the guy says, well, that's what I'm here for. I thought I was doing something back there. And he says, 
Well, do you know you're lost? Well, he's not then. <laughs> Good night. And then they take him and lead him on this polluted doctrine of a sinner's prayer when the Bible says, we know that God heareth not sinners. If you believe that Jesus is virgin born, you'll believe him when he says, except you repent, you'll perish. And that word repent, Luke 13 and 3, is present dense subjunctive mood. That means constant over and over and over and over. You mean you've got to repent over and over to be saved? You've got to repent and get saved over and over? No, because you don't get saved. Saved the whole process. I'm not saying people that say they accepted Christ are not saved. I'm saying that's pollution. So if you really believe Jesus is virgin born, you believe you're going to have to start studying His Word and believing what He says, even if you have to throw out your Baptist doctrine, your Church of Christ doctrine, your Catholic doctrine. See, that's the whole purpose of virgin birth. That's a God. So saying I believe in the virgin birth, so did the people who followed Hercules. So did the people who followed Perseus. Saying that is of no consequence. If you don't yield to the Word of God, then you, there's no need to believe he's virgin born. That's the whole purpose in it. Only a God can be virgin born. It makes me afraid of a God who can come out of nothing. Now, all right, where was I? Now, I want to show you something. We started off, you want to take this back there and let Glenn look at that. You can bring that back to me. You can show the scales. Now, the scales, we're going to talk about that. Let me give you this. Now, Athena was the one in the old ancient world holding the scales. Let me read to you one more time. She, is, she was the protector of cities. In fact, she was the protector of the Babylonian democracy. And isn't it funny we have a democracy? We've got our Lady Justice that has the scales. Isn't that amazing? It is Athena that had that scales. And Babylon was a democracy. Now, let me read this to you. Athena, I'm just going to read a little bit of this. I read it before. I read it before, but I think it's so important. Uh... In post mycenaean times, the city, especially its citadel, replaced the palace as Athena's domain. She was widely worshipped, but in modern times, she is associated primarily with Athens, to which she gave her name, her emergence there as city goddess. Or what if I said fortification goddess, because she was the goddess of battle. She was actually a goddess who had armor on. She went out and fought battles. Reminds me of this stupid TV thing. Zena. What's it? Zena? So dumb. I mean, that woman, she's got arms. If you look, that big around, and she's taking on men who's got arms this big. You know, and she's, she's going boom, flying through the air, and it looks... It looks so stupid, I'm thinking, why don't y'all get a muscle-bound woman to do that? It looks dumb, huh? Yeah, 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 isn't it? Yes. Now, she was widely worshipped, but in modern times, she is associated primarily with Athens, to which she gave her name. Her emergence there as city goddess, Athena Polias, Athena guardian of the city or the guardian of the fortification. Now, you know what they've done here? They've switched roles. It is God who is the guardian. What they did, they started this female worship back in Babel. And have you noticed where we're headed in America? We're worshiping Mother Earth and the women are saying, we want our just place in society. I am not a male chauvinist pig. I am not trying to put women down. I believe we need to lift women up to the place that God placed them in the family. As the teachers and the instructors of the children, the mother was an instructor. A city was called a mother. That was an instructor. Guess where that started? Babel. 
No one had ever built cities to rule over men. Athena, guardian of the city, accompanied the ancient city-state's transition from monarchy to democracy. They came from all the earth, being of one language, one speech, a monarchy, God was the ruler, to a democracy. And Athena held the scales. Isn't that amazing? Because we've got the scales of justice or the balance of the justice scales. That virgin is not Athena. It's not Venus. It is not Aphrodite. It is not Diana. It is Israel. Now who, who is it that gives us, that balances the scales in our life? The father gave the mother the instructions and the mother teaches her children, and who is our mother? Jerusalem, Jerusalem God's mountain. That's what it is. She is she's the mother of us all. Let me read the rest of this. She was associated with birds, particularly the owl. The wise old owl. She was the one that was said to give Perseus his shield, his protection. And she is said to be the goddess of protection, the goddess of fortresses, the goddess of cities, the goddess of democracy. And she carries the scales in justice. He's certainly blind because when you have a democracy, you have the same thing they had in the garden. They had all the earth. It was one language, one speech, and they took a vote. Adam, Eve, and the devil and said, God, you're out. We got us a democracy. We took a vote. We're going to run the show ourselves with the owl, which became famous as the city's own symbol, and with the snake, her birth and her contest with Poseidon, the sea god, and that is nothing but Dagon, or Neptune, or Noah. They deified Noah. He, they called him the great fish god because he came out of the ark, and he gave them all the sciences, and they said, that's what we worship. The sea god, for the certainty of the city were depicted on the pediments of the Parthenon, Hesiod, and the Theogony, told how Athena, having no known mother, sprang from Zeus's forehead. And on the forehead, that's where they wore all their authorities. They wore their bands. That's when you wore a band on your head, you told who you served. And Pindar added that Hephaestus struck upon Zeus' head with an axe, Athena's birthday festival, the Panathenia, concerned the growth of vegetation. Now she was the agricultural goddess, Saturn was the agricultural god. It was nothing but Cush, Nimrod, and Semiramis, the reinstitution of Garden of Eden worship, and they worshipped the vegetation in the garden, didn't they? The tree. And that's what Israel became involved in in the 44th chapter of Jeremiah, the 44th chapter of Isaiah, where the tree goddess was called the queen of heaven and they were all one and the same. The similarly proposed Prochoristeria celebrated the goddesses rising from the ground with the coming spring. How did she rise from the ground? She was, she was the tree goddess. She was always represented as the tree. And Israel became involved in that Venus worship or that Athena worship who was the agricultural goddess. And she held the balances. And she judged unrighteous judgment. Athena's connection with vegetation, however, was only a byproduct of her general civic duties. Athena became the goddess of crafts and skilled peacetime pursuits in general. She was particularly known as the patroness of spinning and weaving or workmanship. Sounds like, wait a minute. She is taking the place of Jehovah God, isn't she? That she ultimately became allegorized to pers personify wisdom and righteousness was a natural development of her patronage of skill. So when we come out of the first decon, 
we go out of the Virgo into the one, and she's the one that's holding the scales in the second, in the second sign of the Maseroth, isn't she? She's holding the scales. So in every sign, when you come out of Virgo, you go into the scales, you go into the scales, and, and in the scales, she's the one that reaches out and holds the scales in the second sign. Now, let me show you something about the true virgin is. Turn your Bibles over. I've got a, some things on virgins I want you to see because the virgin holds the scales of justice. The husband would go off to work. He would leave the information. He would leave the information for the woman, what he wanted her to do, and how he wanted her to teach the children. And he would go off and work, and she would teach the children and she would weigh the scales of justice for the children. But what she did was declare the word of the Father as they went out to work. Now, I want us to turn over here. Let me see here. Let's go over to... Uh, go to Isaiah. Or, for, no, wait. Let's go to... Uh, where shall I start? This is good, I guess. Let's go to Genesis 24, 16. We'll look at a few of these on the virgin. There's two words for virgin in the Old Testament. Two words for virgin, and I'll see if I can get me a pen that's working here. Let me write both of them down and erase this. It's you, We will go out of one sign directly into another sign and in, a, and in the following sign, the, the upcoming sign, something in the first sign of the Maserat will connect directly. I need to put, leave that circle up there because I really need it. Now, let's go over here. Let's hit a few of these real quick. Genesis 24, Genesis 24 and 16. <clears throat> Genesis 24 and 16. If there is a picture of the church in the Old Testament, it is certainly Rebecca. Because the wife of the resurrected one is the church, isn't it? And who was the resurrected one in the Old Testament? That would be Isaac. He was, he was resurrected from the dead loins of his father, the dead womb of his mother. So Rebecca will be a picture of the church. Abraham tells his servant Eliezer, go into a far land and get my son Isaac, who was raised from the dead. Abraham is a picture of God the Father in the 22nd chapter where he goes up uh, upon the mount to uh, offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham is a picture of the Father. Isaac is a picture of, the, of Jesus the Messiah. And Rebekah is certainly a picture of the church or the virgin. And he goes into a far land and I'm going to try to get into, I've been trying to get, just settle down here and study this just in relationship to Christ and his church. Now at verse 15, let's start here in he tells him, he said, you go over there. And the one, uh, well, let's back up here in verse 7. He says, uh, well, gosh, I, I, I need to read the whole chapter, but I, I won't read it. Uh, Abraham said unto Eliezer, verse 6, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, which spake unto me, that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son Isaac from thence. This is God sending his, his Holy Spirit, that's what Eliezer is a picture of, down to earth to, to pull out of this pagan land a wife and bring her home to his son Christ the resurrected one. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this mouth, only bring not my son thither again. 
And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abram, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia into the city of Nahor. He went to Babylon. That's where the church is in Babylon, and the church is going to be have to take it out of Babylon. He says that in Revelation 18 and 4. This is a Babylonian world system, and that's where he went for Rebekah, and that's where Christ is going to have to come back and take his church home. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a water well at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abram, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of waters and the daughters of the men of the city came out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down the pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. She shall say, drink. And I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that hast, that thou hast appointed. God has predestined his wife for Christ, hasn't he? <laughs> and you people say, we all believe in predestination. He appointed Rebecca for the resurrected one. My wife too. Yes, and your wife too. <laughs> I love you, Stan. <laughs> for thy servant, for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. She was already kinfolk, <laughs> wasn't she? <laughs> before I, he said, told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, for whom he did foreknow, have a personal intimate relationship with beforehand he already knew us and Rebecca was already known of Abraham isn't that wonderful Abraham's brother with her picture upon her shoulder and the damsel was very fair to look upon and Christ loves the church and she is fair that he should look upon her Christ is not marrying an ugly wife <laughs> A virgin. Neither had any man known her, and God is going to clean up the church before he comes back. <sighs> and she went down to the well and filled her picture and came up. And you know what? The Jews said that a measurement of the righteousness of a man was how he treated his beasts. How he treated his animals. I love, we got animals. I love my animals. I am, if Cricket comes up and jumps up on the bed and looks at me and going, and it's late at night, I know that she's either thirsty or she wants something to eat or she wants to go outside. And I get up and I say, what do you want? And they said that the righteousness of a person, and they use Rebecca as one of the priorities of it all. She watered the camels. I don't like to see people torture an animal. That really disturbs me. Because they can't help themselves, and God gave them to us. And she was a virgin. Now, let me write that word virgin down. B-E-T-H-U-W. B-E-T-H-U-W-L-A-H. Bethula. The church is Israel. Israel is the church. This is a picture of Israel. Are the church. And the, this word Bethula means, now this is good. Whew. Virgin means two separate. God has separated us from the world, hasn't he? He's called us out of the world and he demands that we separate and live a separate life. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive my wife, my virgin. 
That's what he's talking about. He's to separate a virgin. It means sometimes a bride. And it means sometimes a city or a state. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up and the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him to drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the church, when she is a virgin and separated and living righteous, she will be free in, in her consideration and giving out of the water of the living water, the Word of God. This is what this is a picture of. Rebecca is certainly the virgin. Let us go over here. I've got several of these to look at. That means to separate. God has separated us from the world. In fact, that word deacon means, uh, the word uh, Maseroth means to separate. And it's about the virgin. It's about Orion, Hercules. Or actually, it's Christ is the Hercules. He's the Orion. He is the one who is the Savior, the virgin is the church, or Israel, and the serpent and the scorpion. This is about a great fight through the whole circuit, and the war is between Christ and the serpent or the scorpion, or the giant and the scorpion, and Christ is the great serpent killer, and this is nothing but a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 when the scripture says, I'll betwit, put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now let's go over here to Deuteronomy 22, 23. I'm just going to hit the, a few of these. Deuteronomy 22. Just going to hit a couple of these. 22 and 23. Let me look here in verse 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, they shall both of them die, both the man lay, that lay with the woman, the woman. So shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out of the gate of the city and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. That's a picture of when the woman came, was brought to Christ in John 8. Well, this is talking about someone who was a virgin and she's no longer a virgin because she's no longer separated to her husband. To the one who's going to be. Now, look over here. In, in 2 Kings 19, 21, you've got the same thing. This is the word Bethula. Now, I've got another word I want you to see. 2 Kings, and I'm just giving you uh, several instances about this word Bethula. 2 Kings 19... And verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him, concerning Sennacherib, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, that is Jerusalem. You see, he uses the very same word, Bethula, to indicate the city of Jerusalem being the virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. He's calling Jerusalem the same thing that he calls. This is the picture of Jerusalem. The same thing that he calls the virgin, the Bethula. Israel is the separated one and she is the virgin. She is our mother, our instructor. Well, let's just very quickly look at that one more time. In Galatians, I want to put it down on the tape so people will know this. When the Bible says, honor thy mother and thy father, our father is God. And the Bible says, Jesus said in Mark, the, second, the third chapter, who is my mother and my brother? He said, are not even those who do the will of the father? And over in Galatians, the fourth chapter, our mother is Jerusalem. The mother was an instructor. 
and that is the virgin daughter of Zion. And he says there's two born, one's Hagar and one is, uh, one is born of Hagar, the bondwoman. One, is, one child to Abraham was born uh, by Hagar of Mount Sinai, and the other was born to Jerusalem. And he says in verse 26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother or the instructor or the teacher of us all. Now, she is our protector, and she teaches us, and she's the one that holds the scales, not the blind justice of America or the blind justice of Babylon. Now, let's go over here, too. Let's go to Isaiah 23. Go to Isaiah 23. Give you a few of these because you need to see this. Isaiah 23 and verse 12. And he said, Thou shalt no more rejoice, O thou oppressed virgin, Daughter of Zion, arise, pass over to Chetam, there also shalt thou have no rest. He is talking about Jerusalem. Now let's go over here to, to 37 and 22. Do you realize he uses, he refers to Jerusalem quite often as the virgin. Now, look here to Isaiah 37. 37 and verse 22. 37 and verse 22. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee He's talking about Mount Zion. And then, he's, then he says the same thing in Isaiah 47 and 1. Let's go over here to 47 and 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. He is saying that Jerusalem has apostatized and is receiving her instruction from Babylon now. And she was the virgin daughter. But now she's of Babylon. In 62 and 5, 62, I want you to notice that this is the city. This is the city now. And then we've got two other verses on the virgin that I want you to see that's very interesting. And he used, this is all the word Bethula, or the separated. And here in Isaiah 62 and 5, 62 and verse 5, For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And he's talking about Jerusalem. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now, let's look at this other word for virgin, okay? This is really interesting. Let's go back over to Isaiah 7. This is the virgin that the stars speak of that holds the balances. She is the mother of us all. And she is the one that holds the scales. Back to Isaiah 7. Let's go to Isaiah 7. And here's the other word. Whew. Here's the other word. Isaiah 7. And this is the word. Isaiah 7, and let's start reading here. Now, Ahaz is the king of the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. In verse 1, and Ahaz is, he has been at war with northern Israel. He says in verse 5, Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken counsel against thee. Northern Israel was Ephraim, and they were going to attack Judah. Let us go up against Judah and vex it. Let us make a breach. Verse 6, Therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabael. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason, 
and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken within thirty uh, within sixty five years. Israel, northern Israel is going to be carried in captivity from this point. It'll be just within 65 years that the 17th and 18th chapter of 2 Kings will come to pass and take place that it be not a people. And they were carried captive in 722 B.C. And the approximate time of this chapter is 742 B.C. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, the king of Judah, southern Judah, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above, in the stars. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now it does not say in the original text, Behold a virgin. It says, The virgin shall conceive that is a picture of Israel or the church. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. We know that Mary is the type, but the true virgin is Israel. We just got through showing that, Zion. And it's going to bring forth Christ. The original text says, the virgin, let me see if I've got that, if I can get that real quick. I've got an interlinear Bible here. Won't take me just a minute, and I'll read it from the original text. I didn't intend to do this, but let me read it to you. Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Let me read it from the interlinear. This is the original text. 7 verse 14, here is the way it reads. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and she shall call his name Emmanuel. And some people who say, well, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus is God. Well, Emmanuel means God with us. I don't know what else it teaches. If it doesn't teach, God is with us. Now, this word virgin. In fact, we might, let's just read that verse over there in Matthew, the first chapter. Mary is the picture of Israel. But the true virgin is Israel. That's going to bring forth Christ. Over here in Chapter 1, verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his, possessive pronoun, his, he owns them already before the foundation of the world. They're not goats and become his. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. Holy means pure. That's virgin. Now, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of, by, of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, let me give you this word out of Isaiah 7, 14. In fact, it's the word in Genesis 24. It's the word in Genesis 24 and verse 43. The damsel was very fair to look up. Uh, not 23. Yeah, not uh, 43, not, not 16. 16 was the word Bethula. 
In verse 43, Behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water for thy pitcher. She shall say to me, Both drink thou, and I will draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman which the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And the master would give the son a wife, and he would buy her. Now, that word virgin, and the word virgin over here, this is so fantastic. Let me give you this. This is, uh, wait a minute. I got to open up something here. I was in verse 43. Now, let me give you something. I got to give you this word. This word virgin is so great. Huh? <laughs> I like this one. But I got to find something here before I get to it. Okay, can I take my time? Stan, I have to get my permission from Stan. Boy, All right. <laughs> All right. All right, now, let me give you a drink of this water. All right, now, I need to move this back over here. All right, now let's do this. I'm going to write this down for you. Here's the word virgin. In 714 of Isaiah, in 2443, I think this will, this thrilled me when I got to looking at it last night. All right, if I had enough faith, I could be healed. <laughs> or I could be made whole. <clears throat> I could be saved. Now, here's the word, A-L-M-A-H. <clears throat> that is the word virgin. Now we say, we say Alma, Mater is the word mother. Now see, the Catholics have stolen that from us. We say Alma Mater, or Virgin Mother. That's the school you graduated from. I just thought I'd throw that in in case you didn't know. Huh? Yeah, instruction. That's your instruction. That's why she's called the Alma Mater. Now, now, Alma means veiled, alas, a veiled or private damsel. It comes from E-L-E-M. E-L-E-M. And that word, Elam, it means something kept out of sight. That is the masculine, a lad or a young man or a stripling. And we get the word A-L-A-M, A-L-A-M. And the word Alam means to veil from sight or to conceal. Now, the virgins had the veil over their face. They could not be seen by just anyone. They had the veil removed. We see through a glass darkly now until the marriage supper. We see through a veil. The veil is smoky. We can't see clearly. It can mean blind or a dissembler or a secret thing, but in this case it does not. And then it comes from the word, another word, the same word, A-L-A-M, spelled the same word, A-L-A-M. Sometimes you have different words spelled the same way. It means remote time, the future, or past, indefinitely, or forever, and we get the word O-W-L-A-M. That is the word forever. The virgin has belonged to God from forever until forever, world without end. He has always known his wife or his bride. That's called predestination. <laughs> the word virgin comes from the word forever. She has been concealed from the world. She is an exact person. That's why the scripture says, for whom he did foreknow, she's always been kinfolk from the foundation of the world. 
and forever to them. It meant world without end, always in the past. I know that whatsoever God doeth, His virgin has been from forever to forever. <laughs> Isn't that great? That is, awesome. that is awesome. I love that. It means vanishing point. I like that word vanishing point. It means the point where parallel lines receding from the observer seem to come together. Yeah, a time, place, or stage at which something disappears or ceases to exist, and that don't ever happen with God. I love that. It means eternity. The word virgin comes from the word eternal. It's the New Testament word A-I-O-N. Ionos and Ionos merely means same thing as Olam. It comes from Alma, virgin, forever. We have been God's wife forever. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen the virgin unto salvation. We have always been his wife. This has never not been in the mind of God. God didn't say, hmm, let me see, who will I have to be the wife of my son? He's, God, take, you know what that does? You stop and think about that. Yeah. You stop and think, I have always been in the wife, in the virgin of God. This is so magnificent to think that God would do this. That he would actually choose me when only a few people of all time, do you, do you realize there's not really any chance in it. It didn't matter if it's he chose everybody, but which he did. How can I say this? If there's only 10 in the bride and 10 billion are going to hell, it's not a matter how many you're still in the bride. It's not a matter of, well, what are my chances? There's no such thing as a chance. There's no chances. It's always been from forever. And that's so frightening to realize that God, by his arbitrary choice, has chosen himself a forever virgin wife. That overwhelms me. I don't know about y'all. Now, she is the one that carries the scales. She is Jerusalem. Let's look at her over here. Let's go over here. She is the one that brings forth the child. Let's look at her in Revelation, the 12th chapter. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be teaching on this in the stars. But when I, when I need to go to Scripture, we're going to go to that and we'll come back out of it. Revelation, 12th chapter. Where am I on this, guys? I don't have four. Minutes. Huh? Is that all I've got? Man, I just got started tonight. I don't believe that. I feel like... I thought I've been preaching 30 minutes. Yeah, we do tonight. Good night. I pr this has moved faster any time I think I remember. <laughs> now, now, I just love that. Isn't that great? Now, let's look over here. Here's the virgin that brings forth the sun. We've got to look at 12th chapter of Revelation. Here it is right here. This is Israel. That's what it is. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Now, God has built a tabernacle in the midst of this sign for the sun. Now, the tabernacle of God is where he lives. He came down into the Holy of Holies and he sat down upon the Ark of the Covenant. And he lived in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a mobile temple. Before we go any further, look over here in the 13th chapter. In the 13th chapter. And look at verse. He's talking about the beasts making war with the church. Look at verse 4. And they worship the dragon. Dragon is dracon. Means to fascinate or make someone feel good. 
And it's the word fascinate comes from phallus. That's the male genital. So what's fascinating, makes people feel good, is the sex worship of Babylon. That's the old fire worship system. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. That's the world ruling system. What if I said new world order, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? God, that's who, and not man. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Forty-two months is half of three and a half, is half of seven years, it's three and a half years, 1260 days is 42 months on the Jewish calendar. Uh, it is a time, time, and half a times. So that's half of the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. And for 42 months or the last three and a half years, the dragon or the beast will make war with the church to devour the son of the virgin of Israel or the church. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. To speak against blaspheme is blasphemos. That means to speak against the tabernacle. The church will become mobile once more. We will be running for our lives. And that word tabernacle... It's a very interesting word. It's the word skine. S K E. It comes from S. It's S K E N E. Here's the word tabernacle. People say the church isn't mentioned. The church isn't mentioned after the third chapter of Revelation. Yes, it is. Right here. It's the two witnesses. It's the 144,000. Now, right here, he opened it, and this word tabernacle means, it's the word skinne. It means a wife that's useful to the husband. That's what it means. You guys need to deal with that out there. If there's a wife here, it's the wife of Christ under attack by the beast world system. And it was given unto him, he says, in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it gave unto him to make war with the saints to overcome them. And power was given over all kindreds and tongues and nations. But that's temporarily, that won't be permanent. Let, before I go into the 12th chapter, let's go to the 14th chapter. I've got to show you something. 14th chapter, I've got to show you this is the... What did I do with that? Oh, here it is. Okay. All right. Look at look here in the 14th chapter. And lo, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand. Twelve is the number of the church. Twelve is the number of Israel. That's the number of stars that the woman has uh, under her feet over here. Uh, in chapter 12, having his father's name written in their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunders. And I heard the voice of harpers harping on their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts, and before the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. They were bought back in the scales of justice. Now, whenever we are we sin, we come short of the glory of God. That word short, I said, is who's to rest us. us. And that word, that word means to, it means to be short in penury. It's the same word where the woman gave out, the little widow woman gave too much. She gave out of her word, want. It's stupid. John Abanzini said she's wanting something, so she gave. Wasn't wanting anything. The word want she meant she gave out of her destitution. Stupid to say. She gave out of wanting something from God. I can't believe those guys would say that kind of stuff. Gave her lunch money. Yeah, yeah, gave her lunch money. 
<laughs> Ed, let me give you this word. H-U-S-T-E-R-E-O. H-U-S-T-E-R-E-O. That's, that's the word want. And it means to fall short. And when we fall short of the glory of God, it means to be deficient. We can't pay the price. The price has to be paid, and the price was paid in blood, and the ancients said, in one of my books here, they said that the price, that the weight that balanced the scales was a lamb. Isn't that good? They said the weight that balanced the scales, they said the lamb was the weight that made the scales balance. I thought, when I read that, whoo, that's good, isn't it? You got the scales, the scales are off, and man sins. And if he's placed in the balance, the Bible says, men of high degree are a lie, men of low degree are a lie, and that men of high, well, let's look at it, I forget exactly how it says it, let's look at it, Psalm 62, because this goes in this, this goes in here, huh? Yeah, well, he says, he says here, Surely men of low degree are vanity, men of high degree are lie, and to be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Now, here's the scales. It takes the blood of the Lamb to balance the scales. That's the scales. That's the scale of justice, not held by liberty, not held by Miss Justice, not held by Athena, not held by any of the virgins other than Jerusalem. She demands a price. In the temple of God, they had to sprinkle the blood of the goat on the Day of Atonement. The blood was the price. And the scripture says we're not our own, we're bought with a price. The blood of Christ was paid. Now let's go back over here to 14. And he said, I heard a voice, verse 2. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of great thunders. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred, forty, and four thousand, which were redeemed, bought back. That word means bought back from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This is talking about the purified, holy godly church. The church now is apostate in the world. It is corrupt to the core. And he is saying that the 144,000, that is not a literal Israel. That is not a literal Israel. It cannot possibly be 12,000 out of each tribe because that numbering is given in the 7th chapter of Revelation. It leaves out the tribe of Dan it numbers the tribe of Levi, and Levi was never numbered with Israel. It's an improper numbering for literal Israel. This is the church, and he tells us who it is. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits, the first fruits that came into Israel. The first fruits was the bread crop. And Paul said, We being many are one bread, and the first fruits of the body was the firstborn. That's what we're predestined to. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The firstborns were chosen originally to be the priesthood and since it was going to be so difficult to take the firstborns and form a tribe out of them, God said, I'll let you keep the firstborns of the family. Give me as a shadow the Levites and then when I call the New Testament Israel, the New Testament church, the firstborns, will be the believers, the virgins. The first fruits. That's who they'll be. So we are the priesthood of God, are we not? People say, we're not priests. Well, certainly we are. Priests offer acceptable sacrifice. And he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to give your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he says over there in Revelation 1 and 6, He hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. And over in 1 Peter, look at 1 Peter. At 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Here it is right here. 1 Peter 2 and verse, 
Verse 5, Ye also as spiritual stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the firstborn. That's the first fruits. That's the priesthood. That's the bread. The firstborns of the body is called the first fruits of the body. So the 144,000 is the priesthood. It's Israel. Let me show you this. Exodus. Exodus 19. Look at Exodus 19. I keep saying this. I haven't read this many times. Exodus 19. Verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye, Israel, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel is a kingdom of priests. Everybody's a priest. Everyone brings acceptable sacrifice in the real Israel. So the firstborns, we've been predestined to conform to the image of Christ, that we might be the firstborn. The firstborn is the first fruits of the body. That's the priesthood. The true priesthood is spiritual. Not the ones that went into the literal tabernacle. And we have a high priest of God. That's Christ there in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Isn't that good? That's fantastic, isn't it? Now let's go back over here. I don't know if I've got any... Do I have any... I've got a little bit of light left. A little bit of sunlight. Oh, me. Let's just read a little bit of this first... The 12th chapter of Revelation. Here's the virgin. You see, all that that's written in the stars is about the virgin bringing forth the sun. The virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. This virgin is the alm of the one that has been from forever. It's Israel, the church. And 12 is that number. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a, wo- a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Why do you think it showed her with 12 stars? Huh? How about 12 signs? Huh? Isn't it? And she being with child, the virgin, bring forth the child. This is Israel. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. This is not Mary. This is Israel bringing forth Christ. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. If the woman is literal Mary, the red dragon is literal. The stars are literal, and the moon is literal, and the sun is literal. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about Israel. And we discussed that, and we saw that the virgin was Zion. Having seven heads and ten horns. That's the world ruling system. It's been here since the garden. And seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And that's the picture of the battle of Christ. And Herod was trying to destroy the son, wasn't he? I'm, I'm going to have to get into that next week. I've got how they plotted the stars to show how the wise men came. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Christ. That word rod is rabdos. It's the same word as scepter of righteousness in Hebrews 1 and 8. Same word. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. There's Christ going back to be with God when he comes out of the grave and he goes... And he's caught up in a cloud there in Acts the first chapter. And he'll come again in like manner. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And we skip all the way to the end of time to the last three and a half years. And she is going to be chased by the dragon. And he's going to try to devour her with something that comes out of his mouth. What do you think comes out of his mouth? Fire? No. How about false doctrine? How about 
good words. This is what the, the, what's trying to devour the church and fair speech. You see, we're looking for the wrong thing. Everybody's trying to look for fire. Uh, when this old movie, The Omen, come out, when this uh, movie, The Omen, come out, Mary's nephew got real scared and thought he had to hurry to church because he's afraid spooky things is going to start happening. Not all the spooky things is the blinding of the world they can't see. Let me just read a couple of verses. Let me go down here. Let's go down here. I'll come back and read this again. We'll look down at 13. I'll come back. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. He's not persecuting the child because that's Christ. He's gone on back to be with the Father. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that he might fly into the wilderness, unto her, that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place where she is nourished for a time, time, and half a time. Now we find that in the seventh chapter of Daniel. From the face of the serpent, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. What is he? What comes out of his mouth? Smooth talk. Witches. False teachers, these diviners up here at the Devil's Broadcasting Network, scorpions that care not for the truth. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water is a flood after the woman. That flood is on right now. It's a flood of smooth talk that's deceiving the world that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And you know when I, do you know this verse comes to me a lot? I think of it a lot. That there is a church out there, and we get on TV, and we preach the doctrines of predestination. We teach the doctrine of daily cross and death to self. And we teach that Christmas is pagan. And we teach this prophecy, and we have people, and people call me from Brooklyn and from and from Queens and Chicago and Atlanta, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Los Angeles, where we're on TV, there is a church out there that God has reserved. He has kept the serpent from drowning the church in all of the false doctrine. There is a church out there. And I thought if I preached this hard doctrine when I was a young preacher, I thought, I thought I'll never get people to listen. I'm not supposed to get people to listen. I'm supposed to preach, and if they want to kill me, that's fine. There will be people that hear because God has got a woman out there. It's a virgin church, and she's going to be pure, and God's going to purify this whole thing. And we're going to go 